All right, hey everybody, my name is Nate Ani, and who's ready to vibe code? <laughs> okay, all right, we're gonna do some vibe coding. Um, so this is a, a list, in case you don't have enough ideas of your own, this is a list of 220 uh, ideas. Does anyone, anyone have any like interesting ideas they wanna vibe code? I was thinking of this uh, dad joke. How many dads do we have in the room? All right, we got some dads here, okay. So I'm gonna grab this here, this dad joke generator. I'm gonna hop over here, and I gotta get on my quick start. All right, I'm just gonna put that in there. Actually, first I'm gonna say hello, because, you know, just be friendly. Okay, um, so it's asking me what onboarding path I want. So I want to fully synthesize, a semi-synthesized, or fully customized. I'm going to say number one, fully customized. Or fully synthesized. Okay, we're not going to do surprise me today. Maybe some other time. So I have a brief idea. And it's pretty brief, right? It's just like a paragraph or so. Um, okay, we're not going to do a simple to-do list. Because everybody does to-do lists. We're not going to do that one. So I'm just going to put my idea in there. Okay, so now it's going to get to work. Starting to create some documents. Um, let's see, I already have a Gemini MCP. I've already set up the Gemini MCP server. <laughs> okay, so it's it's getting to work here. It's um it's talking to Gemini, it's putting in a concept, it's starting to generate a concept.md file. And uh, it's gonna make a blueprint. So I think it's good to go. Yeah, I mean this this is the part you know, where I get out some very important tools for vibe coding, because when you're gonna vibe code, you gotta have the right tools. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I'm blind. Uh, you know, I like to block out all noise. <laughs> all right, how's it going? Are we still going? <laughs> Are we still going? <laughs> Oh. <laughs> right, wake me up when it's done. <laughs> okay, you guys get the idea. Uh, all right, so um, what we're looking at here is something called root code. And I first heard about this from this guy named Ruben, who happens to have a fork of root code called root code because it's, it's <laughs> alias is R-U-V. So yes, we're gonna be talking about AI coding while you're sleeping. All right. And uh, I only have a couple little slides here. I'm not gonna bore you with too many slides. But. So this is the guy, his name is Ruben Cohen, and he wrote on LinkedIn, this was three weeks ago, I just let Spark plus root code run for 12 hours nonstop, 100 million tokens, 38,000 lines of functional code, 100% test coverage. Total cost, $68. Once you get Spark running, you can run nonstop until an entire project is complete. We just finished a complete complex client engagement built using Vite, Supervase, Firecrawl, total cost $68. The client estimated it would have taken their team several months to build themselves. That's the command you type in to get this thing going. NPX creates Spark in it. It's very easy to get going. What was even more impressive is one week ago, we finished a complex embedded 5G fiber optics traffic optimization in about eight hours. He went to bed, put his PRD in, product requirements document. When he woke up in the morning, it was done. Mm -hmm. The client quoted $800,000. The client was quoted by some other vendor. He did it for $89. $42,000. When I saw this, I was like, I gotta find out what this guy is using. <laughs> what is he doing here? So he's, he's using something called Spark which is a methodology, specification, pseudocode, architects, revision, and completion. And basically the idea is you have this orchestrator, and the orchestrator is like your project manager. 
So it's basically like ferreting off tasks to what are called modes. So you have a specification writer, you have an architect, you have maybe something to manage your database. And this is a little bit hard to see, but I'll just go through these really, really briefly. So you have a coder, a tester, a debugger, security reviewer, documentation writer, system integrator, deployment. Think of this like your engineering team, right? You've got like everyone that you might need to, to build your application you have as a different custom mode. Um, so I'm just gonna hop over and just give you guys a brief look at how this thing works. Okay, so what we have over here is a, it's called a, a Ruos file. So this file gets created for you automatically. And it's just a JSON file that has all the different modes, what the mode can do, can it use, what files can it edit, uh, what can it, can it access MCP servers, can it edit files. And then when you go into your your room mode config, you can then uh, pick, basically choose among all these different roles. You can say, well, what, what can these things do? Right? So you have a debugger. I happen to be using the OpenAI. But the other nice thing is you can specify uh, what, uh, what models you want to use for different modes. So some models, maybe you want to use a planning mode, a thinking mode. Other modes, maybe you want to use a lower cost model. Um, and it gives you control here where you can go in and specify all your different, um, I can use Gemini, I can put in Claude, I can, and each mode can use a different model. Um, so that, this gives you a lot of configuration. I used to use Windsurf, I used Windsurf for about a month, and I switched to Cursor. Once I found Recode, no turning back. I've really become a fan of the, the power, the flexibility, the automation. Let's check on our, see how our thing is doing here. Oh, we have a question. It's a good thing I didn't go to completely to sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, would you like to proceed? Okay, let's start. So now it's gonna do autonomous build orchestration. It's going to now, uh, you can see what it's done over here. So it's put, it create a concept.md file. So this is like a high level dad joke generator delivery coach. Problem solution goal. From that, it created a blueprint. So we can take a look at the blueprint. Uh, let's see. The blueprint has, goes in a little more detail about our goals, uh, user engagement, functional requirements, non-functional, some of the features, technology stack, monetization strategy, project timeline. Then from the blueprint, it creates a more complete uh, project requirements document. So this is gonna have a lot more detail about uh, user stories, right? As user, I wanna select a joke category. It has data requirements. It has constraints and business rules. A whole bunch of stuff. Um, so we'll just let that, this thing is just plugging away here, <coughs> doing its thing. And so what I, I wanna hop over to one that I started earlier today. So this is, uh, this was on that same list of ideas. This is a called neighborly Skillshare. So it's like a hyper local, you know, teach skills to your neighbors kind of thing. It was one of the things that was on that list. Um, so it it has been chugging away since uh, when did I start this? 102 p.m. today. And the only time this hasn't been running is when I was in Raj's car on the, on the way here. Because <laughs> I had to close my laptop lid and I, I, I could have had internet. I guess I could have connected it, huh. let it run while I was in the car. Um, but it, it is essentially created, let me just show you some of the assets it's created. Well, uh, it's been doing, it's been creating system architecture documents. So you can see like, it's built out a whole It's not very readable, but um, it's been doing a lot of debugging. Every time it, it does a debugging, which it does by itself, by the way, it uses perplexity to basically solve its own problems. It creates a debug report. What it did to solve the issue. Right? It also did a whole bunch of research. Um, 
data collection, it did scope definition, key questions. Um, it also goes out to GitHub and it finds any starter templates that it can use. It could bootstrap my project and help it go. So it found like a Next.js super base template and it used that. It also puts together a, um, a high level test strategy. Hmm. So in here we've got a master acceptance test. Um, so this is really what makes this thing all work. Did it write individual tests? It is writing individual tests. So this is the, okay, because this thing is going, it's, this is gonna be annoying, because it's gonna keep, uh, <laughs> um, but basically there's a, the testing strategy, what's out of scope to test, what the test environment is, the testing strategy, and then what it does is it starts creating these high level tests. So these are, these are all examples of high-level tests that satisfy um, different user stories that we've created. So what are the preconditions? What are the different steps to, uh, to satisfy that test? So once you've got all these tests in here, this thing knows what done is. This is the problem with a lot of uh, AI-assisted coding tools, is they're just kind of wandering, just kind of doing their own thing. If you have tests, you're telling the machine what it means to have the feature complete. And once it, the tests are passing, they're at 100%, it's like, okay, I can move on to the next task. And that's basically what it's been doing since, since one this morning. It's been just methodically going through all of the, um, if we go back to here, you can see kind of a, a log of what it's been doing. So it's been, well, the other thing is it's writing to a memory file. So it, it has a, all of these different modes can all read this memory file to know what each other have been doing. So they don't end up like rewriting tests or rewriting documentation. They're basically, um, it's like a hive mind. Mm -hmm. All of these, all these different modes are all writing to the same file and before they start a new task, they read from that file to see what has been done, what, what issues are there that I need to. And then, okay, this is a good example. It's actually writing to that file right now. Um, well, actually it's writing to the doc. It also keeps a registry of all the documents that it's created. So at any time, it can kind of refer back to this file to, to look at the markdown files or whatever. Um, okay, it says the high-low acceptance tests have been updated to incorporate. Um, so the idea is that it has these, let me pop back to the um, presentation. So what it's basically doing is it's, it's going through a process, right? It goes from concept to blueprint to um, user stories with the product requirements document. It's doing deep research on that product requirements document to go out find competition, find out what other people are doing, um, what are the key questions that we need to be asking, what are any risks involved in the project. Then it's creating these high level tests from all those user stories. It's designing the system architecture. Um, it's searching GitHub for any, any um, templates that it, it can use from Strap. And then it just starts building the app. And the goal is to pass all those high-level tests. And it'll just continue building and building and building. Every time it gets stuck, it'll troubleshoot with perplexity. And um, I found that it's pretty good at searching through GitHub issues, looking at Stack Overflow. Like, it just, when it finds, finds an issue, just, okay, let me, let me look this up. Um, so the next thing I wanted, so what we're actually doing here is we're taking the Spark framework and we're adding this Quick Start wizard. So this is the thing that kind of gave us a vibe coding Cool. capability where we're basically rebuilding Lovable or Bolt or Visa or whatever. But we have more control over what modes, what questions you ask. You could basically build your own Lovable using this tool and have it just ask whatever question you want. And this orchestrator here is basically the thing that hands off subtasks to the worker nodes. And what's cool about this is that if you've ever been doing coding in Cursor or Witzer, sometimes your context window can get huge and it starts losing context, losing memory. And, and you're also paying a lot of money, a lot of tokens, every time it has to go back. So if you don't start a new context window, or a new, a new task, it will basically uh, use a lot of tokens. What this does is the orchestrator, it creates a subtask, and it only needs to have the context to complete that one task. So it's a lot more economical in terms of being able to just fire off the subtask. And then the subtask reports back to the parent about what it did and then it just kind of loops. 
And then the scribe is basically the thing that is writing the activity, like what did what did it actually do? Um, yeah, so this is showing the, the worker tasks down on the bottom and all the, uh... okay, um, how am I doing on time? We gotta got cut it off, okay. If you scan that QR code, um, it'll take you to a, a page that will have documentation on how to get this set up. There's a lot of like videos, a um, couple of things I'm gonna be looking at. There's like an alternative to Spark called Root Commander, which looks really cool. And the memory tool right now, it's writing to a dot memory file, and that can get quite tedious because every time it has to like basically rewrite the whole file. This context portal MCP basically is the same thing, but it's an MCP server. So you can basically keep keep a memory across all these different agents, and I'll be writing to the same MCP server. The so <laughs> memory file is like a tuple space that the sub agents are using to, for job control, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We can look at the memory file. Just it looks like it's basically just like a log of everything it's been doing. Yeah. The accept the criteria and the tests. Can you get that as a nice output to show evidence of testing? Like uh, you mean, can you run? Can you get your test suite? Exactly. Like in QA. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it has 187 tests that it needs to build. It has 77 of them are passing. And there's 110 <clears throat> still left to write. Uh, so, okay, did I? I might have stopped this. Oh yeah, let's go back to it. Uh, I will say that this coding this way, if you're used to like sort of flat rate cursor or windsor, like 20 bucks a month, um, this is gonna cost you more, but I'm looking at using some local models for like some of the, the tasks that you don't need like a thinking model, you don't need the like, most expensive one. So I think with some tuning, I can probably get it comparable or maybe even cheaper than and if you have your own hardware, if you have a really big, fat, beefy machine, you might be able to get away doing this like without paying anything. One-time investment. Question? Last question. Just a few of those files had P2s on them. Is that real feedback, or is it realizing that it did a bad job the first time and it's going to try again? Sorry, could you repeat the question? I couldn't hear you. A few of the files had a V2 on them, version 2. Is that your feedback to the system? I I have had hands off this thing. Wow. <laughs> Occasionally it'll ask me a question, and then I have to like, you know, it'll give me like a yes or no question. It's kind of like the phone tree, you know, when you call and press one for this, press two right. for that. Um, but other than that, it's been autonomously coding the whole day, six hours. Yeah. Where did the opinions come from? Like, like the PRD included like things that are out of scope, which I personally love in PRDs, but like, that's a human preference, right? Yeah. Like, like, so did you have to set that up, or, or, or is some of it just, like, Rue is just pre-opinionated? Like, this is how to do it. So it, it does a lot of research. It goes out to Gemini okay. thinking model. It yeah. does a lot of research mm -hmm. using the, the web, web search grounding, and yeah. it does a bunch of research to generate the PRD. Now, before you hit go, right. you can review the PRD and, like, no, no, leave that out. We don't want that. Or, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's missing these things, or I don't want to use that tech stack. I would use it. So you have an opportunity to review it before it starts building stuff. But it's doing a lot of the legwork for you. All right, maybe uh, um, well, if you will have other questions for Nate, uh, maybe after during our networking session. Uh, but next up is Alex. And